Thank you, Bogalje. Welcome to the Munzil section of Education Matters program. Every week, we profile a highly successful person from the Sikh and wider communities who has reached the pinnacles of their career or their Munzil. We do this to inspire our ch children and young people to learn how these community role models have achieved phenomenal success in their chosen fields. We want young people to fulfill their fullest potential through hard work and education. My guest today is Dr. Paul Bessie, CBE, Chief Executive of Real, Est Real Estate Investors PLC. He is Chairman and Co-Founder of the Bond Wolf Group that was established in 1983. Paul is the former president of the Chamber of Commerce and his previous roles include regional chairman of uh, chairman for Coots Bank, West Midlands. He is also non-executive chairman of Bigwood Chartered Surveyors and is a director of Birmingham Hippodrome. In addition to his com commercial interest, Paul is an active supporter of a number of charitable, cultural and community organizations. In 2007, Paul formed the Bond Wolf Charitable Trust that raises funds for worth, worthy local causes, regardless of caste, color, creed, age, sex, religion, or disability. Paul was the High Sheriff for County of West Midlands in 2009 and 2010, and was appointed Deputy Lieutenant for County of, for West, County of West Midlands in 2008. In January 2009, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Birmingham City University. In 2010, Paul was appointed Commander of the British Empire in the Queen's New Year Honours List. In 2003, Paul was awarded the Price Waterhouse Cooper's Entrepreneurship Entrepreneur of the Year Award. In 2005, he was the youngest ever recipient of the Lloyd's DSB Central England Lifetime Achievement Award. And in 1999, he chaired the historic twinning of Sandwell and Amritsar. Paul is a Sikh, born in Birmingham, and is married with three children. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Hey, I've just given a little flavor of your background, mm -hmm. and thank you very much for taking part in our Manzil program today. Mm -hmm. And um, as you can say, I've just uh, the reason we do this, we really want to connect with our role models so our children can be inspired. Mm -hmm. So I really, as this is an education uh, program, uh, can you just please tell me a little bit about your early education and uh, the family uh, life and, and what do you believe contributed to your early success? Mm -hmm. uh, well, really early life for me was very typical of a a traditional Punjabi Indian family. Uh, my family were fairly early immigrants into the UK, came in the mid to late 50s, and life was very different from, from the world that we see today. I was born in Birmingham, uh, my parents worked in factories, foundries, whatever, mm. whatever it took uh, to feed the found, uh, family. And then they moved uh, to London and uh, bought a house, bought a corner shop, and everything that sort of comes with being a, an immigrant and, mm. and having a hard work ethic. Um, and, and I am a Sikh, but I'm a Jat Sikh, and actually mm. most Jat Sikhs traditionally didn't put a lot of emphasis on education. Uh, my family's view was very much that the family had worked very hard, they'd created a business, and the business would look after us. Um, but actually, um, all the children in my generation, none of us went to university. Um, I, was, I got a H&D from a college, mm -hmm. my brothers and sisters didn't go to further education because the, the view was we had a family business, of corner shops and property and, and that would be fine. Um, it's not a view I subscribe to and actually okay. I've seen um, the, the issues that come with that because we've had, particularly here in, in Birmingham where we've had traditional businesses like clothing, mm -hmm. textile, corner shops that were built for the next generation, but of course Tesco's have taken over the corner shop, sure. textile industries in China, so we've got this new second, third generation that have woken up and not valued education, and actually therefore are kind of lost. They haven't got 
a skill or a career mm. to go out there and do anything with. Mm, so yes. uh, education is essential. Even those businesses that have done very well, where the children want to take them over, without that education, without the network that comes with the education, mm. those businesses will die sooner or later. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not just pushing it because your yeah. program is called Education Matters. Yeah. You know, the education really does matter. Uh, yes, and it's but the, it's on, on that thing. point, um, saying, okay, you know, H&D, you, you know, you had some education, mm. um, but there are a lot of people, uh, including people like Lord Sugar, yeah. uh, who left school at 16 yeah. and yeah. they find their way, but there is this yeah. place called yeah. University of Life, mm -hmm. and you can learn a lot. You know, another message, one of the messages we do want to send to children, that not everybody is academically gifted, mm -hmm. and or they hate school, they hate going to university, they, they don't, they're very practical people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your own experience suggests that there is a lot to learn mm. just by actually yeah. getting involved. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying there's no life without education. Yes. I'm saying that if you're able to provide your children with an education, and if you're a child that's got the opportunity to get education, you've really got to grab it. Because sure. if you've got the Alan Sugar gene, yes. or the instinct to go out and do all those other things, you'll do them better if you've got an education. Yes. It gives uh, you a foundation, doesn't it? And when you're talking about Alan Sugar or, mm -hmm. or whoever, you know, he's one in a million. Sure. So we, we've just got to, you know, yeah, keep, keep our doing. feet on the ground sure. and understand that uh, that's, that's right. not going to happen for everybody. And your early career then, so from college getting uh, yeah, I, I education. I came out of college, I, I went to work for investment brokers. Um, mm. This uh, was in London or in Birmingham? No, this was in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. I, I moved to, um, born in Birmingham, moved to London, came back, mm -hmm. uh, did my education, got a job in an investment brokers. Uh, and started off doing what every young guy does. I, I went and got the sandwiches, I had to make the coffee. Mm -hmm. um, my salary was £250 a month, mm -hmm. um, which even back in nineteen early 80s wasn't a lot. Yeah. Um, and if I was late by a minute, the system was that there was a pound a minute fine. <laughs> so if you were late for 30 minutes a day, yes. it cost you £30. Sure. Uh, and th there was a month or two where actually the paycheck wasn't particularly big, mm -hmm. but I'm never late for anything, and, and, and those are the disciplines that, that you yes. learn. Um, but that was a, um, a job opportunity that I took on, because really, back in the early 80s, jobs for young Asians weren't as easily got as, mm. as they are perhaps today. They are got on merit. We're a far more mm. diverse and multicultural society. So I took this job that essentially was... Uh, performance related. Um, the directors there uh, fell out with each other. Um, I started to do quite well. I had intended to go on and do another educational course, but I did quite well. And then when the directors fell out with each other, that was the opportunity when uh, the bon Bond Wharf opportunity arose. And uh, we started that. I went to a little bank manager called Ian Glaze. He mm. didn't have to fill out any spreadsheets, no mm. forecasts. He trusted me, he liked me and my mm. partner. We got a £1,750 overdraft, right. and the rest, as they say, is history. history. Right, okay, good old days when uh, yeah. bank managers had that sort of relationship. Yeah, yeah. It's very yeah. different now with the collapse of banks and banks being very, very careful. They won't yeah. even give, yeah, yeah. give you a £1,000 overdraft facility. That's right, yeah. I mean, so yeah. that was very. Uh, so that was a real start in terms of a little push with a little bit of a capital, mm -hmm. five, just overdraft facility, not even a loan. It was an overdraft facility. Yes, I think yes. we got it on Monday mm. morning and we were at the maximum by Wednesday. <laughs> okay. So basically it was developing the business that you were working for. Yeah. And uh, so you had an opportunity to be in the driving seat and, and giving yeah. it shape and direction. Yeah, well, we were, you know, very early. I was 22 years old. Mm. I didn't want to work at another place. I felt I'd built up a good mm. profile for myself and what have you. Yeah. Um, and so we, we did grew that business more, but then sort of the mid 80s, there was a property bubble that was in and around me. Yes. Uh, my family had been in and around property, so I had a feel for it. Mm -hmm. So from the broking, we got involved in a bit of property. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I opened our first office up and uh, we had no instructions. And um, I put a poster up in the window saying no fees. And we still didn't have any work, but you know, it, it slowly got there and yeah. then we built a So reputation. that business was like a, a it, estate agent? It, yeah, so we added agency. the estate agency onto the um, financial services. Okay, so part of the portfolio. 
So financial services plus... Yeah, I mean, in, in them days, we weren't grand enough to have portfolios. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, we did a bit of financial best. services. I was now trying to do a bit of estate agency. Yes. Uh, and that, you know, I caught the wave uh, mm -hmm. of that. But um, where... And that was I, houses and not necessarily real it, estate. It, it was just housing. Yeah, sure. It's good, the domestic market. It was the domestic the market. But what, market. what I realised quite quickly that as the agent, I got 1%. Mm -hmm. and, and the clients were making the other 99. Mm. Uh, and from whatever I was earning every month, I managed to save up a little bit, take out a few mortgages, buy a few properties. Mm. And then I sold those and um, more by luck than judgment, although my instinct was telling me the prices were a little too good to resist. Mm. So we then had what I call the real recession in the early 90s, uh, when we had interest rates of 15, 16, yes, 17 yeah. percent. Right. Uh, and that's when I had a little bit of capital. So I went out and started buying parades of shops uh, at significantly depressed values yeah. and then between the uh, early 90s and the sort of late 90s uh, interest rates came crashing down asset valuations went up rents doubled and trebled and so yeah. you know obviously we we were going to be a beneficiary of yeah. that that situation and during that period did you find quite a, it was, again it was a struggle raising finance uh, or any racial discrimination and again the 80s it was, things were changing, but not uh, not as liberal, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the country was still, you know, we, we still experienced mm. discrimination. Probably it was hidden discrimination or subtle. Mm. I, I have no doubt mm. that there was discrimination out there, yes. but really I had no, sure. I, I had no place for it. You never look for it. My view was that if I found a good proposition, mm. and uh, you know, my, my my seek roots are honest, mm. hardworking, uh, you know, we're decent people. Yes. And. If I went to a bank with a decent proposition, I promised them I was going to pay them back. I'd never let anybody down. Yes. Uh, we looked after our tenants, we looked after our staff, we looked after our clients. Actually, we used to have limitless opportunities to go and get capital because we developed a reputation for being yeah. good, good at what we did. Looking at uh, Bond Wolf Partnership, and how mm. did that grow to becoming a sort of a PLC? Did you move it sort of it was organic no, the, growth? The, the Bond Wolf business is still there. In fact, one of my yes. uh, one of my nephews now mm. uh, runs that business uh, with another lad called James, who's been with us a long time. We mm -hmm. do we do look after people, uh, quite rightly. Um, so the Bond Wolf business is still there, um, and we've got the Bigwood business as well, and these mm. are all real estate orientated. Uh, and the Bond Wolf business has gone on to have a private equity arm, so we've bought restaurants and subways, and we've got the Ashes yeah. one that uh, yes, everyone keeps right, talking yes, to yeah, us we'll about. Talk about that. <laughs> um, and yeah. um, you know, I, I fancied the public markets because the opportunities were there mm -hmm. to effectively do in a small amount of time mm -hmm. what it had taken us 20 years to do privately. Mm -hmm. um, so we went to the city, we bought a small stake in a business, um, we then went fundraising as, as you do, yeah. uh, and we we had a fantastic response. Um, you know, I spent. And this is on on, flow, on, on taking uh, uh, Bond Wolf into no, the. No, no, we we kept Bond Wolf private. As a private. Yeah, and real estate investors is the bit that is we the grew, PLC. Is the PLC? Yeah, just for just for our community. I mean, I think again, if, if, just trying to explain what what happens when you are a limited company, and then you say, well, we want some more investment, and you try to put it onto the market and make it into a public limited company, the yeah. PLC. Is that a good way of raising money? Well, I mean, the big difference is in a private company, it's private, yeah. it's yours, it yeah, can be big or number small, of shareholders. Yeah. Uh, and you can get on with it. There's some very successful big companies. Yeah. Um, real estate requires a lot of capital. Mm. Um, you know, we can run into hundreds of millions of pounds on single deals very quickly. Um, and I wanted to, to you know, we, we had a niche, we, we had something that we were good at. Mm. And the difference between the public and the private is when you go in the public, you've now got shareholders. Yeah. Uh, and when we went around the city, um, we were very fortunate to get some great shareholders. I mm. mean, the real blue chip, standard yeah. lives, Caledonias mm. of this world, um, backed us. Um, we went to raise X. Mm. We raised significantly more than X. Yes. and. Um, that capital comes back into the company. The yeah. management team, we've kept fairly healthy equity mm -hmm. in the business, and we reinvested it in the very thing we were doing for the last 25 years, which is sort of regional real estate. Really, I mean, uh, is this a, a message there as well? I mean, I think a lot of uh, smaller businesses uh, really struggle, especially yeah. in our communities, to yeah. raise yeah. funding. 
uh, in this environment, you know, especially now that the yeah. banks are so mm. tight. Um, mm. So there is that avenue, isn't it? If you've got a s solid business, mm. you can try to actually yeah. uh, float yeah. it on the market. Yeah. It's down to anything, like anything, you've mm. got to do it properly. Yeah. Um, if you've got a private family business, mm. it's got to be professional. The accounts have got to be in order. You've got to have good people in place. You've got to take external advice. Uh, and sometimes I, I, it, it concerns me that a lot of our businesses uh, say a little bit insular. They're a, a bit scared to let go a bit and get yeah. some external advice. Um, but the public markets for the right company can be a huge asset. Mm. But you know, there are also, as I said, many successful private companies. Yes, yes, um, but you shouldn't be afraid of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one reason why a lot of our companies haven't gone into the public markets is they continue to network in their own community. Yeah, it's not mainstreaming. Yeah. So you need to kind of, you know, that next generation of kids we've got, you know, my son, my mm. nephews, and, mm. and everyone else is in you know, the next generation kids. They're at school with these guys. They play rugby with these guys, mm. all girls. Um, so they interact better. They can access those markets better. And actually, I think it is something that the, uh, the, the Indian community in particular, mm. I think, will start to go to the public markets yeah. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. The Indian influence in the UK is bigger, yes. and actually the city quite likes mm. that honest, hard I work, work Indian ethic. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, I see that as a growth avenue for a lot of our family businesses. Okay. Just talk a little bit about your other roles. Uh, you're mm -hmm. a very busy person running uh, you know, public mm -hmm. limited companies. But obviously, you're uh, very well known in mm. uh, the mainstream community, but also mm. in the Asian community mm. Mm. for your role, for example, uh, you know, as being the first Asian president of the chamber. Mm. Mm. Tell me a little bit about your involvement yeah. in, in, in work outside, you know, and in the business community, and also yeah. in in your charitable uh, yeah. communities yeah. as uh, work as well. Yeah, I, I um, as I said, I'm deeply religious. Mm. Um, I, I don't wear a, a turban, etc. That, that's my choice. Uh, my grandmother, from a very young age, I was going to the Godwara mm. um, you know, Friday evening, Saturday morning, mm. squeezing a game of football. Uh, a lot of members of my family have taken Amrath. Mm. And um, it's natural for me to contribute to the community. Um, the role model responsibility is something that just gets thrown on you. It's not something you seek. It's yes. It just turns up. And uh, I was approached by... Uh, uh, John Crabtree, mm -hmm. um, who was the old chairman, yes. um, if I would be ch uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and in truth, it's not something I wanted to do. Yes. Uh, I think you're probably aware of that. Yes, yeah. um, I felt that I'd done my community bit. I'm now really quite focused yes, on... Yes, because you were quite involved in the institution business, the IAB. Here I was. I'd been offered the opportunity, although I wanted to withdraw from everything and concentrate on business, mm. I just felt that for the sake of the community, uh, I really should do it. Um, and I did do it, we had a good year. You know, the Chamber of Commerce is, is an international brand that, that, that needs to be developed. Um, uh, you mentioned the IAB, I have to say that I think we've got to a point in time mm. where actually there needs to be a business community yes. here. Uh, and we don't need a Greek, Jewish, Absolutely, Indian, yes. Pakistani. We've been here long enough yeah, we're, to and, be part of the mainstream. And, and that next generation of kids, they want to go and be part of the business community. Yes. Um, so I, I do hope that we move on from needing yeah. separate entities. Um, they've served their purpose, they've been fantastic yes. uh, when they were needed, when we had language issues, when we had reading issues, yes. when we we're had... now into third, fourth generation. You know, we've got some real stars out there and actually I think we're doing them a disservice by yes. having these, uh, these entities. You, you again, were the first Asian High Sheriff. Yeah, Tell me your involvement, yeah. uh, and, and again, this, what does High Sheriff mean for our community? We, we you know, watch Robin Hood and we know about yeah, <laughs> Sheriff yeah. of Nottingham. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the High Sheriff actually is a, um, a role given to you by Buckingham Palace. Mm. Um, it had um, great significance historically that when the Queen or a member of the royal family came to your region, mm. um, you would be her escort. So it's quite an honour. Uh, and again, I think I was the first Asian, not yeah. that that should be an issue. Um, and when the royal family came into the region for my year in office, mm. my job was to meet them, and, and, and etc. Uh, in addition to that, traditionally the High Sheriff was the head of the judicial system. Yes. So when the High uh, Court judges are in town uh, doing anything from a commercial litigation through to a murder, um, my job would be to meet with them, look after them while they were here, 
So I would have um, a couple of dinners, uh, quite formal with judges and the judiciary at home, mm. and my job will be to mix and match them with members of you know the pillars of our local society. You, you, you use the word success a few times. Yes. Uh, I ha I don't feel I'm at all successful because it's a journey for me, and I haven't got to the to where I need to get to. Mm. Uh, and um, until you get there, it's not success. Although sure. I accept other people will look at me in a certain way. Mm. So I've gone back to work uh, and with no external um, mm. roles, particularly I have one role with one bank. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I'm quite focused on um, the main business, as that I've described. Um, family, my children are growing up. Mm. Um, you know, I want to spend as much time as I can with them and look mm. after my health. Yeah. So um, again, I think you touched on your Sikh roots and how important the values mm -hmm. of Sikhi mm -hmm. are in, in your mm -hmm. guiding your life. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? When I wake up in the morning, I pray. When I go mm -hmm. to bed, I pray. If I leave the house mm -hmm. or I come into the house, mm -hmm. I, I, I say my prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether there's a God out there, sure. but, but I, mm -hmm. I, I have my beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time we move to this office, for example, we would have a blessing. Yes. Um, all of our children, when they pass their exams yes. go to you know it's a, it's a family belief yeah. um, but I, I never look upon it as a religion if I'm yeah. being honest sure. I look it's upon a set it, of values it's a set of values mm. they're good values yes. um, and you know I'm, I'm, I'm proud of them um, I even have a tattoo mm. of, on my arm which is quite unusual <laughs> uh, of, of a Sikh Gunda mm -hmm. um, and it's something that gives me a lot of peace of mind it's it's yes. it's mm -hmm. at the core of, of my being and uh, family you've got three children Yes, They're all so grown up now, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. how important is family, and do you well, manage to balance your work and life? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, there are times when you're going through your career mm. when you perhaps don't get to spend as much time with your family as you would want. Mm. Um, but then, you know, by the same token, my mother would tell me that her father didn't see her for 11 years. Mm. So if I don't get to see my son or daughter for a couple of nights a week, it's, it's not a big deal. Mm. But... Uh, they're all very busy in their own careers, and yeah. uh, you know, if I'm lucky, they make a bit of time for me. And uh, your aspirations for your children again, as to you know, well, let them be the individuals. Well, and yeah, the same as you know, for, for anybody really. Yes. You want everyone to fulfil their potential. Mm. I'm very aware that whether it's my children or my nephews, uh, you know, they're very privileged kids. Yes. Um, they've all gone to King Edwards, which is a great yeah, foundation yeah. here locally. Mm. Um, they're good, balanced, hard-working kids. Um, you know, you want them to do what they want to be. Now, if they want to be an artist, a hairdresser, yep. brain surgeon, sure. uh, as it happens, we haven't got any of the traditional trades in my family, so mm. we have no doctors, dentists, or accountants. Mm -hmm. um, but that's fine. Yeah. That, sure. They find their own yeah. strength and yeah. uh, abilities, don't they? Mm -hmm. Finally, Paul, uh, what's your message to young people out there? Family is at the core of everything, um, and always understand that. Um, but if I was giving them a message, I would just have a plan, you know, have mm. a big picture. Don't be afraid to dream. Um, uh, you know, being successful isn't anybody else's God-given right. Mm. Every one of you have the entitlement. But it doesn't land on your feet. It doesn't land at your doorstep. You know, it's hard work. It's reading books. It's meeting people. It's studying. Sure. It's being honest. It's grafting. It's getting up early. It's going to bed late. Do all of those things and I have no doubt you'll fulfill your potential. And again, going back to the education, you know, you're again endorse all kids to actually go out there, whether they're four year old or 14, yeah. you've got to mm. plant the seed. Absolutely. That they uh, can uh, yeah. go to university, yeah. they can achieve. Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot of people who watch your program mm. will no longer be at school. Yes. Education shouldn't stop when you get to 18 exactly. or 21. Yeah, it's um, lifelong learning. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that where I probably jumped out of the norm mm. and I, I intensively read lots of books and uh, you, you can never stop learning you can never stop educating yourself so I'd encourage yes. everybody of all ages to do so and finally your manzil you think you've reached your manzil or no, no, uh, no, you're, no, you're no, still no. still not there like you said you well, earlier said if you have a hundred meter race mm. just because you get to 60 meters quicker than everybody else doesn't mean you've succeeded you know mm. I have a I have a line that I want to get sure. to. Uh, and it's not all about accumulating wealth. There are lots of elements to, to, to success. You know, it, it's your children, it's your health. Mm. You know, it's how you look after other people. It's how you support people that are less fortunate than you. Um, so I've got about another five years of making a few shillings. I think okay. I'll be 55. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, I want to go off and lecture at university, um, do things nowhere near making money. Um, and 
who knows, I might even end up as a Thanks. priest in a temple one day. Great. Thank you very much, Paul, for your time and, and sharing with us your journey okay. and your manzil so far. Okay. And I'm sure uh, we will see a lot more and hear a lot more about you. And we hope to uh, revisit and get an opportunity to interview you maybe in a few years' time. Okay. Thank Paul, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.